easiest way to describe Indian Summer Festival is that it's a festival for the curious mind. Now, to expand that, it's a multi-arts festival that centers and amplifies the voices of South Asian artists in conversation with artists from all around the globe and from different communities. So, in a way, it's a kind of meeting place. It's, it's where worlds meet. So, the theme for this year's festival is tricksters, magicians, and oracles. Tricksters, because we give them the right to offend. Magicians, because they conjure up from nothing something amazing. And oracles, because they light the way forward where we're all headed. And to me, artists are all of these things. I'm so excited to see what the artists at this year's festival are going to do with this theme and look forward to being surprised myself, as I'm sure all of you will be, by what they do. Good evening. There's two of us here, Laurie Anderson, <laughs> and who is the director of SFU's Vancouver campus. And yes, and you're I? Sirish. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah. yes. Um, we have to make this joint announcement and also distinguish each other because people can barely tell us apart. Yes. Um, <laughs> happens all the time. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much, Sirish. Uh, welcome, everyone. To get us started tonight, I'd like to welcome Elder Margaret from SFU to get us started with a traditional welcome. Elder Margaret? Oh, good evening, everyone. Good evening. Great to have everybody here. I wasn't expecting this many people. I was thinking just a small little group of people. <laughs> and uh, welcome to the territory of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh, and the shared territory of Vancouver. If you're new in Vancouver, um, the three reserves uh, work together in developing ideas and uh, protecting the land and the forest, the water. And um, it's great to be part of uh, what they're doing and part of what SFU is doing. And just a quick prayer to get this event going. Great Spirit, thank you for bringing us together tonight. Just guide each and every one of us in the work that we do. Always remembering that we are the leaders and the mentors of those who follow us those who witness what we do and what we say. Great Spirit, thank the communities from which we come from and our families for allowing us to do the work that we do and just to protect our families while we're away on my relations. And welcome to this evening. Thank you, Elder Margaret. Again, I'm Laurie Anderson, the executive director of SFU's Vancouver campus, and this fine gentleman at my side is Laurie, oh no, sorry, <laughs> Riz, R Sirish Rao, the co-founder and artistic director of the Indian Summer Festival. It's our pleasure to welcome all of you, this sold out crowd, to this great event tonight. We're celebrating a birthday here this evening, or more accurately, it's a birthday this year, as the Vancouver campus of SFU celebrates 30 years downtown. Right. What began as a very modest storefront in the 1980s has morphed into the largest educational presence downtown with nine sites and growing. And SFU has become, as many of you know, has plays a pivotal role in downtown Vancouver's intellectual, economic, cultural, as we're here tonight to find out, and social well-being and development. Central to the university's growth in the city and in their other two campuses in Surrey and in Burnaby has been the university's enduring commitment to community engagement. Over the years, we have deepened and expanded this engagement through programs and events and partnerships. Tonight's event is one such initiative. The SFU Vancouver Speaker Series brings global experts to the city to explore critical issues in ways that foster deeper understanding through intellectual exchanges such as this. Tonight's speaker, Amitav, and his topic, of course, exemplify what the SFU Vancouver Speaker Series is all about. It is always a treat to work with our partners at Indian Summer, and with that, let me hand it over to Sirish. 
It's remarkable that Laurie spent three minutes without taking a dig at me, which is very rare. Well, I'm not kidding. <laughs> yeah, okay. um, I just wanted to say that it's been a long time dream to have Amitav Ghosh here in the city and at this festival, um, partly because he really salvaged my family's history for me in his in incredible book, Glass Palace, and, um, and really, in a way, looked at larger forces that we're all a part of and then went, investigated, pulled those threads out, turned that into fiction and gave it to us as a gift to understand ourselves. And, from, and that for that reason, I'm grateful to him for accepting the invitation to be here. And I'm really grateful to SFU, uh, President Andrew Petter is here and will introduce Amitav Ghosh soon, but for the wholehearted support with which you've, not only this, this event itself, but the entire festival that you put your shoulder to, and a particular thanks to, hey, where did you go? <laughs> Laurie Anderson, um, Executive Director of SFU's Vancouver campuses, happy 30th birthday to the campus. <laughs> yeah. Also to other partners, SFU Public Square, uh, Van City's Office of Community Engagement, and as well, SFU Library for um, live casting this for those who couldn't make it into this room. There's a long wait list. We're happy to make it available to them thanks to their support. And to SFU Woodward's Cultural Unit, who uh, we have started our festival in this space and they are our hosts this evening. I'd like to thank our ideas partner, Creative BC, for their support for a range of idea series that we do. And uh, as well, I'd like to thank Hari Sharma Foundation whose support for the South Asian arts in this city is legendary. Um, with that, I'd just like to invite President Andrew Petter to introduce Amitav Ghosh, and thanks to all of you for being here this evening. Well, thank you very much, Suresh and Hachka, Elder Margaret. Thank you, Lori. Um, the Indian Summer Festival has special meaning for us at Simon Fraser University. Uh, it was nine years ago this festival started, the same time this facility opened, and SFU decided that this would be a wonderful partnership, and for nine years it's been an extraordinary journey that we've had together, and I'm so proud and privileged that Indian Summer comes back and continues to ask us to partner with them, because this festival really does exemplify the commitment we've made to be Canada's most community-engaged research university, and that engagement takes many forms. It's local, it's international. Our motto, our tagline is engaging the world. It's about bringing big ideas and having serious discussions, creating a platform so we can really have serious democratic engagement at a time when that engagement is too often uh, pushed to the side and overwhelmed with trivia. And it's in that spirit of international engagement, it's in that commitment to democratic dialogue that it is such a privilege to welcome Amitav Ghosh, one of South Asia's leading literary lights to speak on the urgent issue of climate change. Um, I also want to, before introducing Amitiv, though, give a real shout out to Suresh and to Laura Bespelko, who were the driving force behind this festival. Without them, we wouldn't be here. Without them, uh, Amitiv Ghosh wouldn't be here. So please join me in expressing our appreciation to them. And of course, they are supported by an amazing team. Uh, the Indian summer team is extraordinary. I won't go on because there is much more that could and will be said at another occasion. But we have tonight an extraordinarily special guest, and I know that's why you're all here. Amitav Ghosh was born in Calcutta. He grew up in India, Bangladesh, and Sri Lanka. He studied at Delhi, Oxford, and Alexandria. Not a bad lineage uh, academically. He's the author of numerous books, including The Circle of Reason, The Shadow Lines in an Antique Land, The Glass Palace, the list goes on and on. His most recent book, The Great Derangement, Climate Change, and the Unthinkable, a work of nonfiction, was published in 2016 and earned the inaugural Utah Award for the Environmental Humanities in 2018. His work has been translated into more than 30 languages, and his essays have appeared in The New Yorker, The New Republic, and The New York Times. Amitav Ghosh holds two Lifetime Achievement Awards, and he's barely halfway through his lifetime, so goodness knows how many more he'll get. He also holds four honorary doctorates. In 2007, he was awarded the Padma, 
uh, Padma Shri, one of India's highest honors by the President of India. This year, Foreign Policy Magazine named him one of the most important global thinkers of the past decade. We're very privileged to have him here, and I want you to join with me in giving a warm SFU Indian summer welcome to Amitav Ghosh. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's uh, such a pleasure for me to be back uh, in Vancouver. I've often been here for the uh, Vancouver Literary Festival, so it's really wonderful uh, to be back here. And I'd like to thank uh, Andrew Petter uh, for that wonderful welcome and also for making it possible for me to be here, uh, Maureen uh, and uh, Laurie Anderson, uh, Am Johar for <laughs> the conversation that we've already had this morning and that we are going to have again today, Elder Margaret, and uh, most of all, uh, uh, Sirish and Laura, who've uh, invited me here, made it possible for me to be here, and for their hospitality, and for organizing uh, this wonderful festival. So, uh, <clears throat> I'm uh, going to be talking about uh, 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 this book, uh, uh, The Great Derangement, and do we have the, do we have my thing going? And I need this on presenter's view. <coughs> uh, it seems to be going on and off. Ah, <coughs> uh, here it is, the presenter view. There we are. Great. <laughs> that, that was a bad moment. <laughs> <laughs> because we came hours ahead to actually make sure that it worked. And so uh, when this book came out, my Indian publisher made a, a sort of short film, uh, a, a short video, and I'm going to uh, play you that video. Okay. <laughs> ah, there we are. Climate events are very, very difficult to write about. Extreme events, improbable events are very difficult to write about. And I know this myself as a writer. I had an extraordinary encounter with a very, very uh, strange weather event. I didn't even recognize what it was because, you know, we, didn't, we in India have very little awareness of uh, phenomena like tornadoes. For years afterwards, I tried to write about this event in, uh, in a sort of meaningful way. I tried to sort of even think of incorporating it in my, in my books and novels, and I always found myself struggling with it. I'm a marine ecologist. I've been working in the system quite some years now. And what I can tell you is uh, the oceans are being hit in various ways that you cannot even imagine. Just look at the cost of our seafood production. You know, what does it mean to produce those fish? Well, I'm sorry about that. Um, okay. <laughs> well, I was going to uh, read to you uh, a little bit from the start of the book, so I guess, but uh, I can't do it without the, I have these images to go with it. My recommendation would be, I'm so sorry about this, but we just take a second to get the text to sort this out. I wouldn't want you to do this half-baked. And, then <laughs> and we'll, we'll bring you back up. Oh, OK.
just taking the yeah, I'm just taking the power out to see if that's the problem. There we go. Okay. From climate change to cable change. <laughs> uh, shall we start it again? Okay. So I'm going to start it again. Let's hope it goes through this time. Climate events are very, very difficult to write about. Extreme events, improbable events are very difficult to write about. And I know this myself as a writer. I had an extraordinary encounter with a very, very uh, strange weather event. I didn't even recognize what it was because, you know, we didn't, we in India have very little awareness of um, phenomena like tornadoes. For years afterwards, I tried to write about this event in, uh, in a sort of meaningful way. I tried to sort of even think of incorporating it in my, in my books and novels, and I always found myself struggling with it. I'm a marine ecologist. I've been working in the system quite some years now. And what I can tell you is uh, the oceans are being hit in various ways that you cannot even imagine. Just look at the cost of our seafood production. You know, what does it mean to produce those fish on your table? You know, now the major gear that's used to catch and produce a lot of our seafood is uh, trawl fishers. Now, this is a technique that is really unselective. It's destructive. Uh, you target a few species, but you pretty much catch an entire ecosystem in your net. Now, this not just obviously has an impact on the ecosystem, but it also has a huge impact on livelihoods of small-scale fishing communities that depend on a lot of these fish species, and also a long-term sort of survival of that fishery itself. You have all these multiple stressors acting on a marine system, okay, that have an impact, as I said, not just on ecosystems, but also on livelihoods, and you sort of uh, have the overarching umbrella of climate change. Now that is like the recipe for a perfect storm. Just this year, this incredible heat wave that we've had across northern India and across central India, I mean, it's astonishing, unprecedented. It's been a problem modeling the monsoon. So even now, climate models don't all agree on whether the monsoon rainfall will increase or decrease. But what all models agree about is that the frequency of extremes is going to change, which means the frequency of droughts and uh, excess rainfall years, that is going to be change. Uh, for example, in 2015, you know that uh, we are sitting in Maharashtra. In Maratwada region of Maharashtra, more than 1,000 farmers committed suicide. And you and I were paying more than rupees 200 per kilo of turdal. Now, these are all adverse impacts of the drought. So the question arises, are we adapting to this? And after all, unlike unexpected effects of climate change, droughts are nothing new. We've experienced droughts for centuries. So we should have been able to adapt. Are we adapting to it? Unfortunately, it appears that we are not adapting to it. And still there are very large impacts on agriculture, economy, and so on. If you consider that, you know, Parliament just a couple of weeks ago finally held uh, some uh, a session uh, to talk about the drought and only 80 MPs turned up to discuss what is the most single most important uh, thing that is happening uh, in this country right now. I mean it really does in a way defy belief. The inconvenient truth in climate change is not that climate change is happening but that climate change is about sharing the economic growth between nations and within nations. I mean, if you look at the most recent uh, sorts of um, uh, weather-related events around India, you know, so for example, these terrible deluges that have happened in Mumbai in these last uh, eight to 10 years, this terrible deluge that we saw in Chennai, uh, you know, last year. I mean, uh, you know, those things are, are on our doorstep. 
What does it mean for our cities? It means that we need to design our systems so well that you have much better systems of sanitation. You have no water retention that happens in your cities. You're able to design your green areas in ways in which your green spaces can absorb the extreme heat that happens. You need to design your cities so that you can hold the water when it falls. Over the last uh, 150 years or so, the, the, the direction that literature and literary fiction has taken has carried it away from all sorts of natural engagements. It's carried it more and more towards abstractions of various kinds. It's become, uh, literature has become more and more sort of focused on, uh, on urban areas, on, uh, on the urban experience, on urbanity as such. That to me raises many, many interesting questions. How is it that literature, which in many ways has always historically dealt with the most important issues in the human condition, you know, uh, uh, why is it that literature has turned away from this? In that sense, you could say that, uh, you know, the whole, the whole trajectory of fiction uh, is also imbricated in uh, the same kind of uh, derangement that carries people closer and closer to the sea, where they're so uh, exposed to all these uh, natural impacts. Today, we are voiceless, we are powerless. We are not asking our leaders to step up their game because it concerns us, our present, and our children's future. It concerns the survival of humankind. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to read uh, uh, a couple of pages. Uh, uh, oh, sorry. <laughs> uh, I'm going to read a couple of pages from the from the beginning of my book. Who can forget those moments when something that seems inanimate turns out to be vitally, even dangerously, alive? As, for example, when an arabesque in the pattern of a carpet is revealed to be a dog's tail, which, if stepped upon, could lead to a nipped ankle. Or when we reach for an innocent-looking vine and find it to be a worm or a snake, when a harmlessly drifting log turns out to be a crocodile. It was a shock of this kind, I imagine, that the makers of the Empire Strike Back had in mind when they conceived of the scene in which Han Solo lands the Millennium Falcon on what he takes to be an asteroid, but only to discover that he has entered the gullet of a sleeping space monster. To recall that memorable scene now, more than 35 years after the making of the film, is to recognize its impossibility. For if ever there were a Han Solo, in the near or distant future, his assumptions about interplanetary objects are certain to be very different from those that prevailed in California at the time when the film was made. The humans of the future will surely understand, knowing what they presumably will know about the history of their forebears on Earth, that only in one very brief era, lasting less than three centuries, did a significant number of their kind believe that planets and asteroids are inert. My ancestors were ecological refugees long before the term was invented. They were from what is now Bangladesh, and their village was on the shore of the Padda, uh, of the Padda River, one of the mightiest waterways uh, in the land. The story, as my, as my father told it, was this. One day, in the mid-1850s, the great river suddenly changed course, drowning our village. Only a few of the inhabitants had managed to escape to higher ground. It was this catastrophe that had unmoored our forebears, in its wake, they began to move westward and did not stop until the year 1856, when they settled once again on the banks of a river, the Ganges in Bihar. I first heard this story on a, on a nostalgic family trip as we were journeying down the Podda River in a steamboat. I was a child then, and as I looked into those swirling waters, I imagined a great storm with coconut palms bending over backward until their fronds lashed the ground. I envisioned women and children racing through howling winds as the waters rose behind them. I thought of my ancestors sitting huddled on an outcrop, looking on as their dwellings were washed away. 
To this day, when I think of the circumstances that have shaped my life, I remember that elemental force that untethered my ancestors from their homeland and launched them on the series of journeys that preceded and made possible my own travels. When I look into the past, the river seems to meet my eyes, staring back as if to ask, do you recognize me wherever you are? Recognition is famously a passage from ignorance to knowledge. To recognize then is not the same as an initial introduction, nor does rec recognition require an exchange of words. More often than not, we recognize mutely. And to recognize is by no means to understand that which meets the eye. Comprehension need play no part in a moment of recognition. The most important element of the word recognition thus lies in its first syllable, which harks back to something prior, an already existing awareness that makes possible the passage from ignorance to knowledge. A moment of recognition occurs when a prior awareness flashes before us, effecting an instant change in our understanding of that which is beheld. Yet this flash cannot occur spontaneously. It cannot disclose itself except in the presence of its lost other. The knowledge that results from recognition then is not of the same kind as the discovery of something new. It arises rather from a renewed rec reckoning with the potentiality that lies within oneself. This, I imagine, was what my forebears experienced on that day when the river rose up to claim their village. They awoke to the recognition of a presence that had molded their lives to the point where they had come to take it as much for granted as the air they breathed. But of course, the air too can turn to come, come to life with sudden and deadly violence, as it did in, the, in, in Cameroon in 1988, when a great cloud of carbon dioxide burst forth from Lake Nyos and rolled into the surrounding villages, killing 1,700 people and an untold number of animals. But more often, it does so with a quiet insistence as the inhabitants of New Delhi and Beijing know all too well, when inflamed lungs and sinuses prove once again that there is no difference between the without and the within, between using and being used. These two are moments of recognition in which it dawns on us that the energy that surrounds us, flowing under our feet and through the wires in our walls, animating our vehicles and illuminating our rooms, is an all-encompassing -encom presence that may have its own purposes, about which we know nothing. So since I showed you that uh, short uh, video on climate change impacts in India, and since, in fact, you know, one of the really curious things about the whole, uh, uh, the whole discourse on climate change is that it is actually, in a bizarre way, very uh, Eurocentric. It's very focused on the West, even though we know that the parts of the world that are going to be most adversely affected uh, are, are not in the West. I mean, in fact, uh, they're really in Asia and Africa. So I want to talk, so I'm going to talk to you, you know, give you, I mean, these impacts are so vast and so complex that it's hard even to give you a sense of them, but I'm trying to, I'm going to try and indicate to you some elements of uh, what's, uh, what lies ahead you know, uh, for especially for, uh, for India and for South Asia. Well, one set of impacts that's, that's very clear, that's really coming down uh, very, very fast down the turnpike is, of course, drought. A drought, we, uh, uh, you know, there's been a sort of ongoing drought since 2016. I mentioned it in the film. This year, it got even worse. Uh, the drought is, is spreading to more and more parts of India. Farmers are, farmers are leaving their land in droves. And, you know, uh, actually what we have really is a kind of perfect storm. It's not just climate change. It's climate change and various kinds of man-made impacts have meshed together in the most disastrous ways. So, for example, uh, uh, farmers who've adopted certain kinds of seeds now find that they don't have enough water for that kind of seed. Their ancestors had drought-resistant crops, but they no longer have those seeds. They no longer know how to grow them. So uh, it's, you know, it's a kind of spiraling disaster. And at the same time, you have these huge dust bowl effects that are happening, these gigantic dust storms that are advancing on, uh, on cities in the north and, and, and in western India. Then there are the major flooding events, which you will have read about. 
Uh, these floods are accelerating. We are seeing the impacts uh, in more and more disastrous ways all the time. And uh, it's generally known, really, that uh, <coughs> Uh, uh, that, uh, uh, you know, uh, the countries of uh, South Asia, especially of India, um, in India that, uh, you know, the cumulative carbon emissions are tiny. So you can see India with its uh, 1.2 billion people, the cumulative carbon emissions are only there. The U.S. is there, um, uh, you know, <laughs> Russia, UK, uh, Canada doesn't figure on this particular, uh, but I can tell you, uh, you know, <laughs> it's, it's, it's pretty big. Uh, so, uh, now, th this is the curious thing, of course, that, uh, you know, if you look at this, uh, if you look at this list of the top 20, uh, in you know, the uh, corporations that are responsible, really, for uh, this disaster that we are facing now, there is one Indian company, Coal India, and that's... Uh, but again, I mean, you know, uh, that's only one company. The rest are actually all, uh, more or less all of them, Western companies. So this is the curious thing, again, that this change, the sort of emissions that are coming out of Asia, uh, out of the Asia-Pacific region, how quickly it's happened and how, how fast they've risen. Uh, so it's basically this, uh, uh, if you look at this 10-year period, how quickly the, the emissions have risen. But at the same time, these emissions have really, uh, this gives you an even better sense of how quickly the emissions have risen. I mean, if you look from 1960 onwards, basically it's from this period, uh, let's say uh, about 1990, that we see the steep, steep rise uh, in uh, emissions coming out of, uh, uh, coming out of Asia. Uh, and uh, the reality is that it's basically in these last 30 years, uh, the period of the Washington Consensus, the end of uh, communism, and so on, uh, that's responsible for more than half the uh, greenhouse gases that are now in the atmosphere. Uh, yet, despite all that, if you look at this, you'll see the, that the uh, per capita, uh, in terms of per capita footprint, uh, India is amongst the lowest, and uh, China is actually amongst the second lowest groups, whereas up here you can see uh, <laughs> what, you, <laughs> what you have out there. And, uh, of course, now increasingly the largest uh, carbon footprints tend to be in the Middle East, in, uh, in, uh, in the Arabian Peninsula, uh, in the Emirates, and so on. So, I mean, uh, this, is a, this is an often repeated uh, truism that the countries and the people who are perhaps uh, least responsible for cumulative emissions are those that are really going to pay the price. And very many of those people are in Asia. The, the enormous bulk of those people are in Asia, and very many of them uh, are in South Asia. So, uh, I'm, so uh, uh, this is uh, in relation to sea level rise. Now, there's no dispute about sea level rise. Everybody knows. Uh, we've been tracking sea level rise for a long time. So you can see that in relation to sea level rise, how... How badly, how badly India is going, uh, South Asia is going to be affected. I mean, this is actually the most densely populated part of South Asia. Uh, 250 million people live in this uh, uh, live in this uh, in this area. Bengal, uh, which is actually a delta, it's a delta of the Ganges Brahmaputra, and that is actually where I'm from. Which is, I suppose, one reason why. Uh, you know, I've become sort of obsessed with, uh, with, uh, with climate change. But again, if you think of uh, Kerala, Kerala is over here, very densely populated. Uh, Tamil Nadu, the, the, basically these coastal plains are the most densely populated parts of India. And, uh, you know, uh, very large parts of them are actually going to, become, uh, are going to become uninhabitable. Now, usually when we talk about sea level rise and the impacts, we, uh, we do so in relation to, say, uh, uh, you know, the Pacific uh, island nations. But uh, uh, see, uh, Tuvalu is said to be the first uh, uh, island nation that's likely to go underwater, but tu Tuvalu has a population of less than, uh, uh, less than 10,000. Whereas uh, one, half of one island, this is Bhola Island in Bangladesh, half of it went underwater uh, a few years ago, and that displaced, uh, uh, that displaced over uh, half a million people. So that it's the sheer numbers in relation to uh, in relation to South Asia that make make these uh, that make this scenario so utterly terrifying. So this is uh, this is the Bhola cyclone of 1970, 
Uh, it's regarded as the worst natural disaster of the 20th century. Uh, people think that the figures are not so good, but people think that it's, uh, it killed directly maybe uh, 500,000 people. Uh, some think that it actually killed uh, a million people. It happened in 1970. Uh, it also precipitated the Bangladesh war. Uh, because uh, the Pakistan government at that point, uh, th at that point Bangladesh was East Pakistan and the Pakistan government really didn't respond adequately and uh, this uh, played a large part in the, uh, in the gestation of the Bangladesh War of Independence. So uh, you can see the, the aftermath of the Bhola cyclone, how devastating it was. Uh, it, it, uh, uh, so again, now the Bay of Bengal is a very cyclone prone area. And cyclonic activity, as you know, uh, it's not quite clear exactly what impact uh, climate change is going to have on cyclonic activity, but it's thought that uh, we may have fewer cyclones, but the cyclones that we do have, uh, uh, cyclone is basically the word that we use in the Indian Ocean for what uh, in the Atlantic is called um, hurricanes. So uh, as you can see, what we have here in these areas, every time a major cyclone hits this deltaic region, one of the things it does is that it carries a lot of salt water very deep inland. So more and more fertile land becomes unusable, which is actually what's happened uh, in this area, which is called the Shundurbun. Uh, so uh, you, know, you can see here, these are very heavily populated areas. With, this is the actual sea level, but with a one meter sea level rise, this entire region is going to go under uh, 1.5 meters. The, uh, that much land is going to go under. In fact, these uh, impacts are already unfolding. Many of you will have read about those house collapses, uh, building collapses that happen in Dhaka. Uh, you know, actually, uh, what, uh, 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 one story that's often not told about those houses is that the people who are working in them come from two or three districts where there's enormous salt water intrusion, Burishal district and so on. So they have to flock to the cities uh, to, uh, to make a living. Uh, again, uh, you know, it should be said here that it's not just, uh, uh, it's not just uh, uh, a sea level rise. Again, it's one of those uh, terrible sorts of enmeshings of different kinds of impacts because uh, uh, Deltas across the world are actually sinking at four times the rate of sea level rise. This is because of uh, a subsidence. Subsidence has many natural co uh, many co causes, mainly uh, you know ground uh, groundwater uh, over extraction, extraction of oil. But uh, again, it's the it's the it's the great deltaic regions of uh, Asia and also Africa. The Nile Delta uh, is very very badly affected. So you can see sea level rise in relation to land subsidence around some major cities. Most of these cities are, um, are in Asia. Jakarta, as you, uh, as you may have heard, is actually going to be relocated because Jakarta is no longer even defensible. Uh, it's, it's, so, uh, it's so exposed to floods. And here again, if you look at the relative vulnerability of coastal deltas, you can see the numbers of people who are going to be, who are going to be displaced. Uh, the Ganges Brahmaputra, you know, already there, you can see how many will be displaced there. The Godavari uh, uh, Delta, again. But, uh, you know, I feel a, a very special connection with Egypt because uh, as a student, uh, I, I lived there. And uh, the Nile Delta is actually uh, really, really bad news uh, because, um, you know, even when I lived in, the, in a small village in, uh, in Egypt, uh, the land was so heavily, uh, you know, infused with chemicals, fertilizers, and um, and insecticides that if you left it fallow for two or three days, a white crust would emerge on top. And this is because, of course, it's not swept clean by you know the uh, the Nile uh, the Nile floods. But now salt water subsidence is happening in a massive way in the Nile Delta, and uh, you know these uh, these impacts are actually. <laughs> Unfolding. I mean, uh, I spent some time interviewing uh, migrants in uh, Italy, you know, those who are arriving across the Mediterranean. Very large numbers of them actually from Egypt. So uh, again, you see the same thing, the Indus Delta, the Indus virtually doesn't reach the sea anymore. Uh, this is what it peters out into, this kind of, uh, you know, what can you even call it? It's just a sort of uh, a muddy drain. Uh, 
uh, that over there used to be a mill that uh, ex exported red rice from Pakistan to the Far East and Persian Gulf countries, and now, as you can see, it's, uh, uh, it's already uh, underwater. So here again, as you see, the impacts of just one meter of sea level rise, and uh, actually at this point, hardly anyone disputes that there's going to be a, um, a one meter sea level rise. So all this is already baked in, you know. Um, <clears throat> Uh, this uh, entire island chain, which is actually uh, in this area, it's very low-lying, but it's uh, very rich in corals and uh, sea life and so on. It's actually just going to uh, go underwater. It's, I mean, it's already more or less baked in. So, uh, so which countries are most in danger from, sea, uh, from rising sea levels? As you can see, China, uh, because China, again, has enormous coastal populations concentrated, especially around, uh, say, this entire region uh, from Shanghai southwards. But India, Bangladesh, and actually one of the real surprises is Vietnam. Vietnam is incredibly vulnerable to sea level rise. Already now, a lot of their fertile land in the Mekong Delta is, uh, is going underwater. Uh, okay, so that's sea level rise. The other thing that, <laughs> that really one has to worry about a lot, again, I said, uh, you know, the drought, a uh, land degradation. Land degradation is happening across, uh, across the world. It's not just, the, look at the rate at which deserts are expanding in China. Uh, China already feeds an enormous number of people with very little uh, arable land, proportionately. So both for India and China, this is, a, the, this is an unfolding disaster. Uh, here you can see the probability of the occurrence of drought and drought-prone areas. So India has always been very severely water-stressed. So, uh, you know, here are these parts, and actually these are some of the, uh, some of the uh, most uh, industrialized uh, and prosperous parts of India. This is Gujarat. Uh, our prime minister is from Gujarat, and, uh, you know, half the elite of India is from Gujarat. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's almost uh, in, in uh, perpetual drought. And Rajasthan, of course, is a desert area. But this entire belt is extremely water-stressed. Um, as you can see, and uh, this uh, in these last few years, you know, I mean, this is a picture taken this year of these farmers in the Punjab. You know, uh, really, this is what they're faced with. Uh, there's there's nothing left to plant, and you know, again, it's a, it's partly a man-made disaster because uh, India uh, subsidizes electricity to farmers. So ever since the introduction of uh, uh, you know pumps of electric pumps. Many farmers just sat there pumping up fossil water, and now that fossil water has almost run out. So here again, as you can see, uh, this is about uh, you know, the areas that are resilient. Uh, basically, there are uh, a thin strip over there, a couple of strips over there, and I think this, uh, uh, this is just uh, 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 this is, uh, uh, wishful thinking. <laughs> this area is not at all uh, resilient, as we are increasingly beginning to see. So, you know, these are the sorts of uh, uh, fearsome landscapes that you see now, uh, this year, especially in India. Uh, just these last few months, it was absolutely astonishing, I mean, the impact of the drought. So, uh, again, as you see, water stress by countries, I mean, uh, uh, of course, the worst stressed countries are in North Africa and, uh, and the Middle East, but again, India, China, very severely water stressed. 54% of India, as you can see, faces uh, extremely high water stress. The groundwater wells are running out, which means, in fact, that the aqu aquifers are uh, very severely depleted. The upper Ganga aquifer, which uh, actually goes between India and Pakistan, is almost out of water. Uh, you know, 300 million, 400 million people depend on it, and it's almost uh, out of water. So, see, I mean, the numbers are, again, absolutely staggering. And even the water that is there is so badly contaminated. And, uh, you know, uh, India's 120 out of 122 countries on the, uh, uh, on the water quality index. So now what you have is really a lot of the burden falls on women, uh, especially, uh, especially little girls and so on. They have to walk for miles to uh, go and fetch water from some, uh, you know, some faraway place. Uh, this is uh, now the situation in Chennai, India's fourth largest city, and actually one of its uh, most prosperous cities. It, this year, it ran out of water virtually. So uh, what happened? I mean, the government is now distributing water in tankers. 
So this is what happens. Uh, early in the morning, someone will run out and they'll put their little, uh, they'll put their, uh, you know, water pitcher out in order to collect the water when the tankers come. Uh, uh, this is the scene. You know, this is, uh, this is a tanker. This is one of the mobile tankers pumping, uh, uh, pumping out water. Uh, these are the tankers now. Uh, you know, this is in Maharashtra. Maharashtra, again, is facing, again, this is one of the most um, advanced, industrialized parts of India. Uh, they're facing this incredible water crisis. Uh, uh, this is just uh, 160 kilometers from uh, Mumbai. Uh, so uh, this is what is happening now. Uh, you know, the government of Maharashtra has to send these tankers. These are tankers in movement. The tankers are going uh, from village to village distributing water. Uh, this is how people uh, receive the water. And where does this water come from? Again, this is fossil water. It's being pumped up from aquifers. This water isn't just lying there for people to use. You know, so again, you, you can see the sort of spiral that's, uh, that's occurring there. So these are people collecting water. So, and again, uh, to return to the question of water, one of, the uh, one of the really scary aspects of climate change is that uh, the glaciers, you know, this area in the middle of, uh, in the, uh, in the middle of Asia is known as the, uh, as the third pole because the rivers that rise here, there's so many important rivers, the Ganga, the Brahmaputra, the Yamuna, the Yangtze, uh, all the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the Mekong, the Irrawaddy, the Salween, all of them rise in this area. And uh, they're fed, they fed by glaciers. And the glaciers are basically, uh, you know, they're becoming very erratic. So here you can see this is the glacier in Bhutan in 1921. It was in this situation. Uh, today, that is, that is all that's left of it. Uh, this is the Gangotri Glacier, which feeds the, uh, which feeds the Ganga. And you can see how much it's retreated, you know, uh, uh, from being there. It's come all the way, uh, it's come all the way back here. So uh, again, uh, you see uh, pictures of Himalayan glaciers, 1928. From, uh, th that's what you have in 1928. Now you have this little uh, puddle of ice. Uh, so uh, what's happening is that you see rivers. This is a major river, the Yamuna River. Uh, you know, uh, in, uh, in some seasons it runs dry. Again, uh, this is uh, this is the Ravi in Himachal Pradesh. It's a it's a Himalayan river, but uh, you can see. Again, uh, it's because a lot of them have been dammed in very unwise ways as well. So it's not just the glaciers. Uh, it's, uh, and at the same time, when they do, uh, when the rivers do flood, they flood in this epic way because that's actually what's happened. I mean, the rivers, the flow of the rivers has become so unpredictable that when they flood, they flood in this incredible... So this is flood water. Uh, uh, you know, you remember the terrible uh, uh, floods uh, of the Indus in Pakistan. So all that being said, I must say that the scenario which really keeps me awake at night is something that I'm going to <laughs> talk to you about now. And uh, it's about Bombay. So this is, uh, these are early pictures of Bombay. Bombay, of course, uh, uh, Bombay and New York were founded at almost exactly the same time in the 1660s. And uh, the Dutch, uh, you know, uh, played an important part in, uh, I mean, they founded uh, New York. Bombay was uh, founded by the Portuguese, and then it passed in the, in the dowry of Catherine of Braganza to, uh, 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 to, the, uh, to the English. Now, the interesting thing about, uh, about Bombay is that it's India's now most important port. 40% of India's uh, um, uh, exports and imports come through Bombay. But Bombay is right on the sea. Now, if you look at older cities, older port cities around the world, this is Lisbon, you can see they're never built on the sea. Uh, you know, people had a certain respect for the sea. You look at, uh, you look at Kiel, you look at, uh, at Lubeck. Uh, uh, you look at, this is uh, uh, Miao uh, uh, in, uh, in Myanmar. It's a, very, it's a very ancient port city over there. It was built way inland. But uh, Hangzhou is uh, built inland. Uh, but when we come to Bombay, uh, the British, by this time, Bombay is a colonial city, just like, uh, just like um, New York, Manhattan. And the British looked at these, and they thought, oh my goodness, uh, these are islands. They're easy to defend. They're easy to supply. So let's build our cities here. So that's where they decided. So you, uh, uh, from the 17th century onwards, you have this huge spate 
of building right on the sea. Uh, so this was Bombay. This was an estuarine landscape when uh, it, it, there were six or seven islands. Uh, at, uh, at, uh, uh, at high tide, this is what the islands look like. So over the years, this is what Bombay has become. It's basically all reclaimed land. So these islands are now a peninsula of reclaimed land jutting out into the sea. Uh, you know, we say reclaimed, but <laughs> the sea is now <laughs> is going to, I mean, it's the sea that's going to reclaim, you know, with, uh, 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 with uh, sea level rise. Now, uh, this, is, uh, this is what Bombay looked like in the late 18th century. Uh, it, was a, it was a sylvan, pastoral kind of place. These are pictures of Bombay in the 19th uh, century. Now you have this. Uh, uh, you have this enormous conurbation with, uh, in, the, in the greater Bombay area, 25 million people. Now, you, you look at... You look at the way that uh, the population has, grow, uh, has grown in Mumbai over uh, 350 years, 10,000, you know, at the time of the founding of the city. And now this is just, uh, this is just central uh, Mumbai. The greater Mumbai is actually uh, m much bigger. Mumbai also has many of India's most important institutions, the stock exchange. Uh, now, one of the strange impacts of climate change is that there's been an intensification of cyclonic activity in the Arabian Sea. So this is a, a, a cyclone a Burjan in 2012. One of the reasons why this is happening is because the waters around uh, India are among some of the warmest in the world. So uh, this is one of the predicted effects of climate change. Uh, Arabian Sea is going to get stormier. Uh, these are some of the uh, some of the uh, some of the cyclones that have been occurring of late. Now, if one of these cyclones, and it almost happened this year, recurves and strikes Mumbai, now that is what really uh, that is the thing that really terrifies me because really Mumbai has absolutely no defenses against a, uh, um, against a major cyclone. And you know, one good thing that came from my, write, uh, from my writing this book uh, is because I describe you know, Mumbai's cyclone risks. And the book was read by uh, uh, climate scientists in uh, Colombia. And they've actually started studying these risks systematically, started advising the government how to uh, create mitigation measure, measures and so on. So maybe uh, you know, uh, the book was worth write, uh, writing after all. Uh, so you see the ways in which these cyclone-prone areas are, uh, are becoming actually more and more uh, 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 vulnerable to cyclones. So this is, this, is, uh, this is a topographical map of Mumbai. These are all very low-lying areas. Now, the thing about a cyclone is that a cyclone does its damage through the storm surge. And the storm surge is the wave that precedes the cyclone. And uh, the greater the fetch of the cyclone, that is, the longer the distance it travels, the worse, uh, the, 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 the taller uh, the, the wave is going to be, the storm surge is going to be. And because of the Arabian Sea being what it is, this, these are the, are the poshest parts of Mumbai. They're also the most heavily uh, settled parts of Mumbai. And a cyclone that recurved would go just bang uh, straight into uh, those areas. Already, because of sea level rise, this is a, a great... Uh, 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 one of M Mumbai's landmarks, the uh, uh, Gateway of India. And you can see, uh, uh, you know, when it was built, the sea never came over there. This was the plaza where people gathered. Uh, sorry? Uh, yeah, but now, that, uh, now there you see. So Hurricane Sandy, when Hurricane Sandy hit, uh, hit New York, New York is actually protected. You know, New York has, the, uh, it's inside a bay. Uh, it's way in over there. And even then, you saw how much damage uh, Hurricane Sandy did. Uh, Mumbai has no such, uh, has, has, has no such uh, defenses at all. In fact, all these areas, especially the sort of uh, uh, reclaimed areas, are extremely low-lying. This is what it looks like. I mean, the probable path of a hurricane would just go smack uh, right into these buildings. And these buildings aren't built to uh, withstand hurricanes. They have no reinforcements. Uh, the only way that you can protect a city if you know that a cyclone is coming is to evacuate. This is, uh, 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 this is uh, uh, a station in Mumbai on an ordinary day. <laughs> this is what happens when Mumbai actually has, Mumbai's had several of these rain bomb events, and these are the terrifying things. Uh, 
uh, Mumbai actually has only two major arterial roads, two or three arterial roads leading out of the city into the hinterland. And this is on an ordinary day, the traffic. So imagine if you were trying to evacuate uh, 10 million people from, uh, uh, from downtown Mumbai. I mean, what a task it would be. And Mumbai is just about the only city in the world that is right, uh, that actually has a nuclear reactor. Uh, in its, uh, uh, in its uh, uh, the city limits. Not only that, uh, there's another nuclear reactor that is a uh, 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 hundred miles away. So, you know, that's very much, it could be very much within the footprint of a, of a storm surge. And this, uh, 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 my old friend, uh, Professor Ramana, who teaches at uh, UBC, told me yesterday that this Tarapur uh, uh, installation is actually a very old one, and it, 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 it's the same model as the Fukushima uh, reactor. So, you know, you can just see the concentration of risk is such in Mumbai. Uh, this happened on 26 July 2005 in 24 hours, uh, you know, 994 millimeters. So, you know, th uh, th this is a rain bomb event. It's not even a cyclone. So I, I just want to <laughs> show you a few clips of uh, what uh, uh, fl uh, flooding events in Mumbai actually are like today. It'll give you some sense uh, visually of uh, uh, what happens. So here, this is the gateway of India. This is, uh, 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 this is a rainy day. Uh, this is what they call a sunny day flood like you now have uh, in, uh, in Miami, you know. Uh, you know, these, were area, <laughs> these roads never used to be flooded. And now, back there is the Taj Mahal Hotel. And if you, uh, if you look out of the Taj Mahal Hotel, this is what you see. You see these uh, constant floods. You see the roads barred off, uh, people not being allowed, uh, uh, not being allowed inside, uh, because uh, people are, can actually be swept away, uh, you know. Uh, and so uh, this, is, uh, this is one of the recent floods. It's, uh, I think it's the 2005 flood. Uh, this is what it's like inside the city. You know, I mean, you have these raging torrents going through the city, sw sweeping away. I mean, it's, uh, uh, you know, cars, etc. One of the most horrific things. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, uh, the, one of the most horrific things that happened in these floods is that, you know, the people's cars would short out and then they wouldn't be able to open the windows and get out. And they would actually drown inside their car with the water rising. So now our friends in Mumbai all carry hammers inside their car so that they can knock the windows out. This is the, uh, this is the airport. Uh, this is the busiest airport in South Asia. You know, and uh, uh, actually just uh, last week, there was another major inundation in Mumbai. So this is not, this is not, the, uh, we are not talking about things in the distant future. We are talking about impacts that are unfolding before our very eyes from day to day. I mean, uh, <laughs> this is, uh, this again was the 2005, this is the railway station. And, uh, you know, it's basically the, railways, uh, the, uh, the railway lines really keep uh, uh, Mumbai functional. I mean, without the railways, people uh, become uh, completely marooned. And that's actually what happened uh, on the 26th, uh, you know, the, the 2005 flooding. Many, many people just became uh, marooned inside the city. They couldn't go home. They couldn't see their loved ones. Uh, the, uh, the cellular networks went out. They couldn't reach their children. Uh, it was a completely traumatic event for so many people. So, uh, you know, uh, uh, this happened very recently. This is uh, July 1st. <laughs> uh, you can, it's, uh, it's incredible to think that, you know, uh, in effect, what Mumbai represents is a concentration of risk that is actually, uh, you know, beyond belief. Anyway, I'll stop there, and now we are going to, <laughs> we're go uh, we are going to have a conversation. <laughs> I think we can switch this off now. Thank you.
Amitav, thank you so much uh, for uh, showing such a, a breadth of generosity and uh, how challenging these times are. And your book uh, was fascinating to, to read and spending some time with you this morning. Uh, we did a podcast this morning with Olive Dempsey from Big Bright Dark, which is a climate change based uh, podcast. So we had a chance to uh, speak uh, uh, for, for a little while. Um, in reading the book, uh, Amitav, uh, you write that our lives and our choices are framed in a pattern of history that seems to leave us nowhere to turn but toward our self-annihilation, that there's a disconnection between the performance of resistance and where actual power resides. Uh, how do we think through this rift? Uh, I really don't know. <laughs> I wish I knew. <laughs> I would have a huge secret in my pocket. Uh, but, you know, we... <laughs> Look, we've seen over the years, I mean, a sort of continuous uh, disenfranchisement, uh, if you like, of, um, uh, you know, of people. I mean, the most obvious example of it was uh, with the Iraq war. I mean, millions of people demonstrating in the US, in Canada, in Europe, around the world, and it made no difference. Uh, you know, um, sadly, it's become the case that governments know how to corral off uh, protesters, how to contain protests in ways that it, in which they become very ineffective. And, uh, you know, so really they didn't, they didn't make a mark. And in relation to, uh, to climate change, it's, uh, it's going to be hard to see, you know, how these protests register. At the same time, I must say that I do think that Greta Thunberg has made a huge difference, that the Extinction Rebellion uh, protests in London have really started something that's very important and major. So maybe that'll lead to something. Mm -hmm. um, there's a resort, uh, you talk about this in the book, there's a resort to the moral or the individualizing ethics of climate change, but we need to find a way out of this individualizing imaginary that we're trapped in today. That climate change is a problem of the global commons requiring collective action, something beyond individual ethics, and that there seems to be an exhaustion also of democratic institutions and international diplomacy. Uh, where can we look to in order to imagine a collective response that functions at this level of power or where power is functioning? Yeah, th again, that's a part of this whole sort of perfect storm that we're in, you know? I mean, this massive collective problem uh, is, uh, is on our heads exactly at a moment when uh, neoliberal ideology tells us to treat everything uh, as a problem of consumer, consumer choice. You know, there's always this sort of individualizing thing that you, know, you can solve it all through uh, you know, what you buy or whatever. And uh, really, in relation to climate change, uh, that's, that's not even beginning to be realistic. You know, I mean, of course, it's a good thing if you make certain, uh, certain kinds of choices and so on. But, uh, you know, the idea that uh, we can all change everything by being the change that we want to, uh, we want to see, uh, it really can't work like that. It's just not possible. Uh, you know, because... <laughs> 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 you know, it's such a strange, sad thing that uh, Mahatma Gandhi, who was actually very prescient about uh, the nature of uh, uh, industrialism, has got stuck with this, <laughs> with this particular <laughs> saying, because that would not have been his, uh, his approach at all. But, <laughs> but uh, you know, uh, just one example will suffice. You know, uh, see, if you, if you look uh, for images of your carbon footprint, you know, the American carbon footprint, the Canadian carbon footprint, you'll, you'll see hundreds of images, you know, which show you, which break it down so that uh, how much uh, you're responsible for in terms of um, your accommodation, in terms of transportation, and, uh, you know, the meat you eat, or all those little things. It's broken down in that way. What it doesn't tell, what this doesn't tell you is that a quarter of greenhouse gas emissions actually comes from uh, defense establishments around the world, you know. Uh, so <laughs> where in the carbon footprint does it, uh, uh, does it accommodate defense expenditure? And what can you do, or what sort of choices, consumer choices can you make that would actually make a difference to defense expenditure? So it's in these ways often that, you know, when we think about climate change in this individualizing way, 
uh, it often becomes a kind of concealment, uh, you know, of the of the bigger of the bigger picture. In the room that we're uh, in today, in the cinema, we've had uh, previous speakers over the years here, uh, people like Gwen Dyer, who's uh, written a book uh, on climate wars. Um, Christian Parenti, who uh, has written a book called Tropic of Chaos, looking at uh, areas of the world where uh, he doesn't make the argument that climate change uh, directly causes war in these situations, but that it exacerbates uh, through drought and other means uh, existing ethnic, political, cultural, nationalistic sentiments that leads uh, it with the possibility of war. And you showed some things that the, the, the causes of rising sea level does, uh, but you talk a lot about the book uh, in Asia and, and how do you read the geopolitical situation related to the impacts of climate change that could exacerbate these types of tensions, not just there, but also other places? Um, <laughs> that's a very big question uh, and it would take me a long, long time to answer. Uh, suffice it to say that I think um, that really climate change is unfolding as an arena of conflict. You know, it's a kind of, uh, how shall I say, it's a kind of uh, displaced conflict, if you like. I mean, that it's not a direct conflict in the sense of people firing guns at each other all the time. But the one thing you can see is that um, the theater, the principal theater of this conflict is going to be the Indian Ocean. And if you look at the countries that are increasing their defense expenditure fastest, uh, most of them are actually in the Indian Ocean region. Actually, the, the country that spends uh, the most on defense as, uh, as a part of its, uh, uh, as a proportion of its GDP is Oman. You know, um, Oman, Saudi Arabia, these countries are, I mean, it, it's, it's quite clear that people see that there's an enormous, uh, that there's enormous potential for conflict, uh, you know, and that this conflict will be concentrated uh, in the Indian Ocean region. How that conflict will unfold, uh, how these uh, conflicts will unfold, um, I don't think anyone can really predict. But I think Christian is, uh, is right, really, that, you know, uh, these, um, uh, these stresses, for example, in Syria and so on, have uh, greatly exacerbated, um, you know, other political stresses. I don't, I don't think you can ever say that any particular war or any particular conflict is caused by climate change as such. But uh, you know, many people, uh, many analysts believe that uh, you know the long-term drought in Syria really did uh, contribute a great deal to uh, what's happened later. In terms of uh, uh, in terms of India, and uh, you know, already India's put up a massive fence to keep out Bangladeshis. I don't think the fence is working uh, uh, because actually, uh, you know, you can put up a fence all you like, but the problem is uh, that. Uh, you can't guarantee that border guards are honest, uh, you know. And this is a, this is not just a problem in India; it's a problem also in Europe and in uh, I'm sure in the uh, in North America as well. So um, you know, uh, it's very hard to control these flows. But uh, clearly, we can see already in uh, in North America. I mean, just uh, how much of uh, the flow of migrants has disrupted uh, the politics. Um, you observe in the book that the climate crisis is also a crisis of culture and thus of the imagination and that forms of arts and literature are engaging in forms of concealment regarding the climate uh, crisis. And you, you mentioned uh, of climate crisis leads to banishment from the preserves of serious fiction. It's been banished to the outhouses of literature like science fiction and fantasy. <laughs> uh, you say that when future generations look back upon the great derangement, they will certainly blame the leaders and the politicians and the bureaucrats, but they may hold artists and writers to be equally uh, culpable. Uh, for the imagining of possibilities, not the role of po politicians and bureaucrats, you write. So from your vantage point, what's at stake for uh, writing and literature today, given the climate crisis? Uh, look, you know, I'm a writer. <laughs> I've made my whole life in writing. Literature is my life. I've, um, you know, devoted myself to it. But, you know, now when I look back on the literary traditions that uh, I was exposed to, you know, you begin to see that there's something so profoundly wrong. I mean, for example, the other day um, I was in a house where there were many volumes of the poetry of Tennyson. 
uh, you know, and uh, I'm of that age when, you know, as a schoolboy, you were taught poems by Tennyson. In fact, uh, the one poet I can probably recite is Tennyson, uh, you know. But I was reading, so I was, I was going through these uh, uh, poems, and then I suddenly uh, uh, came to this uh, a part of his very famous poem, uh, In Memoriam, uh, you know, where he, uh, where he says that the ape and the tiger must wither so that man can achieve his, his spirit. You know, I mean, this was their idea of, the, of man's relationship with the world. This was the Victorian idea of how people should relate to the world, that everything that is non-human uh, must be exterminated. And that included, uh, mind you, people like you and me. Uh, you know, <laughs> uh, <laughs> because, uh, you know, uh, the category was there was the human and there was the brute. And we were the brutes. Uh, you know, uh, we were in that whole sort of domain of the brutish, if you like. Uh, so, uh, you know, when you, when, you look at, when you look at that, when, uh, how can you say that uh, actually uh, that literature was uh, the domain of some sort of healing uh, elixir? It wasn't, you know. I mean, it was completely complicit in these. I mean, uh, Tennyson, of course, I mean, apart from <laughs> wanting... Uh, you know, the extermination of tigers and apes and so on. Uh, I mean, he writes The Charge of the Light Brigade. I mean, you know, it's all about a sort of celebration of empire. It's a, and the, and the, the celebration of empire is about the em, em, dominion also over nature. So, yes, I mean, I do think that there is, uh, you know, when we look back upon this history, we really do have to question ourselves very deeply about what modern literature was about, what, was, uh, what were its essential commitments. In the book, you make uh, a distinction between capitalism and empire in your critique of the climate crisis. And so how do we think this problem of empire through and how do we distinguish it from, from capitalism? Well, you know, most analysts, including uh, your very own uh, Naomi Klein, whose work I hugely admire, uh, she would make the argument that empire and capitalism are indistinguishable, that capitalism is really um, uh, the dominant form and empire is a subsidiary form. But I don't think that's true. I think it's actually the other way around, that empire and uh, uh, you know, power as such is the dominant, uh, in, is the dominant driver. And I think we see that in relation to climate change also, uh, you know, uh, uh, very much we see it. After all, what is it that really prevents uh, uh, countries from making a massive uh, change to uh, alternative renewable, renewables, whatever you want to call them? Of course, there are various kinds of constraints, if you like. But since the 19th century, or since really the late 18th century, Essentially, power is, has been indistinguishable from the use of fossil fuels. You know, what really made it possible for the British to so comprehensively defeat, uh, let's say, Indian armies uh, in the late 18th century? Because until then, actually, uh, they didn't have an easy time of it. I mean, even in the late 18th century, uh, the Dutch, who were then a very important power, uh, met with several defeats at the hands of Asian, uh, um, uh, Asian monarchies and so on. Basically, it was fossil fuels, and uh, you know, that allowed Britain to um, uh, establish a complete stranglehold, and it happened very fast. I mean, if you consider that um, you know, during the Opium Wars, uh, Britain sent, uh, the Opium Wars were really won by one uh, coal-powered steamer, the Nemesis. You know, uh, in one nine-minute barrage, it uh, completely destroyed the Chinese Navy. So it was that, uh, so since then, really, uh, fossil fuels and the projection of power have been inseparable. Uh, you know, and I think that's the dynamic that we are seeing, that uh, even though people may want to transform their domestic economies, whether they'll want to transform their military economies in those ways, uh, I, you know, is really open to doubt. Uh, near the end of the book, you do a close reading of two texts, the Paris Agreement and Pope Francis's encyclical on the climate crisis, and you refer to the giddy virtuosity of the Paris Agreement as if there's this irrational exuberance of, it, of their signatories backslapping each other. Um, uh, and, and you do talk about the encyclical as more of a philosophical and a moral text. 
but how do you reconcile the possibility of religion in um, uh, supporting and scaling up the fight for climate justice uh, with the legacy of its colonial past, and particularly in its relationship to indigenous communities? I look, uh, uh, you know, I, f I was writing this book in 2016, and that was when uh, these two documents came out, uh, you know, the Paris Agreement and uh, the Pope's encyclical, Laudato Si. And, uh, you know, w when I, re I read them in tandem, and when I read them, uh, I was very struck by the differences in them. And, uh, you know, uh, I'm not a, te a technocrat, I'm not a technologist, I can't, uh, you know, read these documents in that way, but I am a writer. And I can bring to bear upon these texts uh, uh, my skills as a reader, you know. Uh, so, you know, just uh, examining them for their, for their rhetoric, for the way in which they deploy their rhetoric, it's, it's very, very interesting. I mean, the, the Paris Climate Agreement is very, very important. Let's not have any doubt about that because it did bring together, you know, the nations of the world and for a while at least kept them together, <laughs> you know. Uh, uh, but... Uh, uh, you know, the language of the Paris Agreement is very curious. It's a very obscure language. It's constantly seeking to, to enshroud, you know, everything in this kind of uh, obfuscation, if you like. Whereas uh, the Pope's Laudato Si is exactly the opposite. You know, uh, the rhetoric of it is a, a sort of striving towards openness. You know, it's written in very simple language. Uh, it's, um, it's got very complex ideas distilled into very simple language because we know that the Pope was assisted by a committee of uh, very important scientists and so on. Uh, and I think, you know, uh, what the Pope had in mind, and this is probably to do with his uh, background as a Jesuit, is that uh, he was really trying to address the poor. Uh, whereas the uh, climate agreement, the Paris climate agreement, was really trying to, uh, uh, trying to address, how shall I say, bureaucracies, you know, politicians, governmental people, and so on. But, you know, the Pope is the Pope. Uh, his words reach immediately 1.2 billion people, you know. And beyond that, uh, you know, he, he's looked up to by people from many other religions. So I do think that, you know, his document uh, was, really, was really a landmark. You know, probably the most important thing that's been written uh, on the subject. Uh, uh, most of all, because, you know, if you look at the uh, Paris Climate Agreement, nowhere does it say that anything went wrong. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Nowhere is there an acknowledgement of failure. You know, that nowhere is there, a, is there an acknowledgement that something about this model isn't working. They don't even use the word disaster, or catastrophe, or anything like that. You know, whereas the, Pope's, uh, whereas the Pope's encyclical is so straightforward in that. I mean, it says straight away that, you know, what we are facing is a catastrophic failure of our models, of the ways in which we live. And if we can't accept that, how do you even begin? Uh, now, you have a new work of uh, fiction that's out in other parts of the world. It won't be uh, available in Canada, I think, until September. But I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about Gun Island. Uh, yeah, th this is my new book. It's called Gun Island. Uh, uh, it's uh, just come out in India and in Britain. Uh, won't be out in North America until September. Uh, you know, it's a book about the realities of our world as I see them, uh, you know. Uh, and I think that's really what one has to try to do, to try and address these realities that are unfolding around us, you know. Um, so that's my attempt. <laughs> Thank you so much. I think we're going to open it up to uh, questions from the audience. And the way we'll format this is that we'll take uh, three questions in a row and allow Amitav to respond, and we'll go back uh, out to the audience. I think there's going to be a couple of people with mics that will be coming around. If you could. There's a question just up here in the front. Coming, and another one over here.
Thank you for sharing your knowledge. I don't know whether I want to go to Bombay now. But anyway, I wonder if Indian Summer Festival should be held in Bombay as well to bring you there. But I, my question is, what do you think of the younger people? Like there is a young girl in Sweden who has created this Friday event for the school children to come out. And then there are politicians like uh, Alexandra Cortez in, in states bringing the, because I, I find that the green parties are now everywhere mushrooming and you find a lot of uh, alternative energy is coming up. So it seems like there is hope in hopelessness. So I was wondering, do you have any country in mind which you would say, go and visit and enjoy the hope? <laughs> we'll take another question yeah. there and then we'll come back to the answer. Uh, so we're Woman in the front, right here. Hi. Um, so I'm very grateful for this presentation. It's like a lot of uh, good information and quite alarming as well. Um, my question was um, regarding the fact that you said the defense expenses, defense, and fossil fuel are big, playing big role in the climate disasters. If you had any uh, thoughts on the factory farming in the meat industry making an impact on big climate changes. Just that. Thank you. Uh, okay, sure. Um, well, I'll take, yours, uh, I'll take yours first. Yeah, I think industrial agriculture of every sort is a, uh, is a, is a huge problem, and certainly the industrial rearing of meat is a, uh, is, is a very major problem. And, uh, it, you know, it absolutely should be addressed, and we should be thinking of uh, you know changing our food systems, which are, in any case, extremely vulnerable. But uh, you know, uh, I think one important caveat that we have to make in that is that uh, in India, for example, uh, there's an attempt now to enforce vegetarianism uh, on people, and I think that is a really uh, misconceived idea. Because, uh, you know, Sunita Narayan, who you saw in the, th uh, in, uh, she's made a very important argument saying that, uh, you know, uh, most Indian farmers are agro-pastoralists. That is, they rely upon their animals for, uh, you know, uh, for very essentially for nutrition, but also for income and so on. And if this form of nutrition were to be completely taken away from them, we would really face a very major crisis. In any case, these animals are not industrially reared. You know, they are household animals. So, you know, when we are talking about uh, industrial um, meat rearing, we are really thinking about those gigantic, uh, you know, hog farms in North Carolina and so on. I mean, those are, I mean, appalling beyond belief. Uh, yeah, yes, yes, yes. Uh, and uh, yes, uh, you had a question about, uh, well, you named some of my favorite people, people I'm fans of, <laughs> I'm a huge fan of, uh, Greta Thunberg, um, uh, Ale Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. I, I think they really, uh, you know, they really provide us with some glimmers of hope, uh, you know, in this world. And certainly they do seem to, uh, to herald some kind of uh, awakening. And uh, Extinction Rebellion, uh, what it's already achieved in London, I think it's quite remarkable, you know. Uh, certainly they've, uh, I mean, last year would we have imagined that the British Parliament would declare a climate emergency? I mean, of course, in a way, these declarations are also meaningless. <laughs> because we know that what happened here in Canada, one day you declare a climate emergency, and next day you open a pipeline. <laughs> 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 Sad, but true. Any more questions? The other one, the uh, so we'll take ah, which ahead. country? Yeah. Uh, you know, it's hard to say because sometimes, you know, countries which have low emissions are often uh, countries that actually export their emissions to other countries in <laughs> exactly. Asia. Uh, you know, like, for example, uh, Switzerland or Germany. But I think the one country that one hears about consistently uh, lowering its footprint is Costa Rica. We have a question in the front here. When I hear your story, um, it makes me f uh, return to my business mind where you have to let the people that you're trying to serve fail before they will listen. That there's no point in arguing. There's no point in doing anything to convert. 
There's no point in doing anything individual. And in a sense, when I looked at the numbers, you know, uh, India was yellow, but there's no, there's no effort. There's never been an effort to reduce the number so that it is yellow. Because if the population was not so high, it would be red. And we're at a point where we're always looking at figures that show one part hurt by another part. But the fact is, we're all responsible that we are overpopulated and for everything that we do. And in a sense, the floods must come. We must have millions of people starve. The US uh, must uh, have a crisis in New York City. The electricity has to go out in New York. And, and th those things... If you could finish with... All I'm saying is that um, it's only fear, it's only incredible fear that I believe that will make any difference. Great, thank you. We'll take one more question and then Amitav will <laughs> respond back. Is there one back here? Go ahead. Hello there. Um, you, you mentioned that you are aware of uh, the approval of uh, the pipeline, the Kinder Morgan pipeline expansion through BC. And, uh, and BC, BC the, as a province, has also approved a massive gas plant in the northern part of the province. My question to you is, if you could speak to Canadian policymakers <coughs> and BC policymakers today, what would you say to them? Uh, yeah, uh, well, the first, uh, the first uh, the, um, uh, issue first. Yes, I think we are all in some ways responsible, but we are not all equally responsible. And, uh, <laughs> you know, I mean, that's really the, that's really the point. I mean, the po uh, you know, what the Pope says, again, I mean, this is one of the ways in which Laudato Si is such a remarkable document, is that he points out that, you know, you can't say, uh, you can't, the argument about population doesn't hold, because, I mean, one Indian... Uh, consumes le uh, I mean, uh, you know, 20 Indians consume less than one American. Uh, for Bangladesh, it's even more. You know, like 40 Bangladeshis consume less than, uh, uh, than one American. So how can we say that it's just uh, abstractly about population? It's, it's not. It's about what that person consumes. I mean, what each person consumes in relation to, um, uh, you know, um, um, in relation to population. So uh, th there's that. Uh, so will these disasters, I, I, we were talking earlier today about, I think there are many people out there in the world who are basically waiting for the disasters to wipe out half the world, uh, you know. Uh, but what can you say? I mean, you know, do we really want to go there? There's a good word for what that is. It's genocide. Um, you know, do we really want our imaginations to get... Uh, engaged in thinking in those lines. Unfortunately, I do think that there are a lot of people who imagine that this will be a natural solution, uh, as it were. I think you can think that, but there's no way that you can think that and also claim to believe in the claims of a welfare state or any kind of democratic state, you know? Yes, uh, the, uh, the other question was, uh, uh, yes, uh, you know, <laughs> let me say straight away that I'm, uh, I'm a novelist, <laughs> I'm not a technocrat, <laughs> I'm not a policymaker, uh, I, I would not presume to advise uh, politicians, and, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> well, the most basic stab is, <laughs> it shouldn't happen. <laughs> you know, <laughs> there I completely agree. I mean, that's the most obvious thing. I mean, you have to put an end to it. Mm -hmm. And especially, you know, when you have a country that's this rich and is rich in, there's so many other things it can do to be, be richer and richer and richer. Why this? <laughs> it doesn't make sense. Uh, we, <laughs> we have uh, time for two more questions. So um, there's one right there. And another one here, okay. G go ahead. Yes, I wanted to, uh, to know, you, you talked about in the, in the 18th century how people, you know, how Tennyson said, get rid of the animals, they're not important, humans are important on top of the pyramid. And I wondered, um, 
if you felt this was connected to traditional Christian theology, which sort of says the same thing, man has dominion over the animals and that kind of thing. And is that still a pervasive thought form that's keeping us where we are in some fashion? Great. I'll take this question right here. Yeah, well, my question is uh, very related to that question. I am very fascinated by your concept of the failure of culture and um, this focus on individualism and power um, being specifically located within certain uh, people. Um, and, you know, obviously we need to engage our imaginations and there is a lot of power in culture, especially with the internet and the capacity to send messages around the world. So I'm just wondering if you had something to say about new narratives that we could model. Thank you. Very interesting questions, both of them. Uh, look, uh, in relation to Christianity as well, I don't think uh, I, d I don't think it's a simple story because yes, you do have uh, those words about the dominion over nature, but then you also have Saint Francis of Assisi, uh, you know, which is a completely uh, different. Uh, you have uh, you know throughout Italy, for example, and I think this is especially true of the Catholic traditions that they have the Madonna della Orta, you know, of the gardens, the Madonnas of the gardens. Uh, the saints of uh, the saints of herbs of trees, so I don't think that it it's a simple uh, you know that it's a simple equation, but I do feel that I I I I, I certainly do think that it's uh, it is the case that uh, you know we have to profoundly rethink the ways in which we relate to nature, or the, the ways in which we relate to other beings you know in the world around us, and uh, you know. Which brings me to the uh, to the other question: that how do we find these other narratives? And for me, I must say, per, I, I think that question can be answered in many different ways. But for me, I feel that the great resource that we must draw upon here is the traditions the, of in, the indigenous peoples of the New World. I think that's a, that's an enormous resource that we have to draw upon to just try and cleanse ourselves of a, the ways of thinking in which we have become immersed. You know, um, but can that be anything other than a minority enterprise? I really wonder, because you, know, you mentioned the internet. And yes, the internet has made uh, many forms of communication possible, but I can tell you that the principal form, of, form that it has made uh, universal is consumerism. I mean, I have never seen, I mean, I would never have imagined that consumerism would reach as deep into India and Bangladesh as it has. You know, I mean, I think that's really the, the driving force behind all this, that never before in human history have all people desired the same things. You know, and what are these things? They're, you know, refrigerators and washing machines and, you know, uh, and uh, that's, in fact, been uh, the effect of the internet. And I, I really wonder if it's, uh, if it's not too late to stop that. Thank you so much, Amitabh. It's been wonderful to hear from you. I'd like to invite up Suresh Rao for the final word. Well, I was just here to say that you can continue to engage with Amitav because he will be signing books outside. So, sorry, Amitav, were you going to uh, say sure. something? I mean, yeah. well, I mean, uh, if, if it's... Uh, sure, I'll take one sure. from the back of the room. <laughs> Thank you. First of all, I think that novelists are great because lots of people, including me, have learned a lot from novelists. And not just uh, literary issues. We've learned a lot of science and so forth. So a few facts. Number one, I believe the purpose of education is to teach critical thinking. And the purpose of advertising is to prevent critical thinking. And we live in a world where advertising has artificially created a demand for so much consumerism, and therein lies the problem. 20 of the world's largest corporations produce 70% of the CO2 in the atmosphere. The American um, military is the biggest military in the world, and they produce a hell of a lot of it. 
So what we need, Actually, my question is, <laughs> isn't it necessary uh, to compensate for the fact that we don't live in a democracy, that the large corporations with all the money are who control our life on the whole planet, and that we actually need to get rid of this consumerist type of society in order to save the planet. Thank you. Right. Thank you. I, I think most of us would agree with you <laughs> on most of those issues. Yeah, I think in a way that's the message that we take away this evening. And I would like to thank all of you again for your attention. Amitav, for, for being so generous with your time. Am Johal, who elegantly but silently slipped onto stage, who is the director of Van City Office of Community Engagement here at SFU. <laughs> Elder Margaret, for your welcome and your greeting. Thank you. Um, I also wanted to remind you that there are several more events at the festival. Um, in this very building tomorrow, we have a great writer who is sitting here in our midst, Deborah Baker, who will speak on the beats in India. Uh, she looks at Allen Ginsberg's 18-month odyssey through India, and then shortly after, Ginsberg would come here to do a poetry conference in 1963 and set off um, all those movements in Kitsilano and papers like the George Strait. <laughs> <laughs> um, a fascinating journey of how America looked to the East for salvation in a particular moment in history and the cultural effects that had. It's, an, it's a remarkable book. She's a remarkable mind. So please look out in the program for that event and come to it tomorrow. Also tomorrow here in this room is five comics. If any of you have listened to the debaters on CBC, um, the same producer, Richard Side, is testing out a new comedy format with five outstanding comics, including Zarka Nawaz, who created Little Mosque on the Prairie, to push the limits of humor and to question, is there a way of making fun which is not punching down? When does a joke go? Uh, when is a joke too far? And that's an exciting format that we'll be here this evening. And finally, on Friday the 12th is at the Chan Center a concert between Ustad Amjad Ali Khan, the greatest living master of the Sarod, and Sharon Isbin, three-time Grammy Award-winning classical guitarist, meeting uh, to bring together strings from two parts of the world in an eloquent call to harmony in music and in people. So please do come to other events at the festival. Thank you again for your attention to tonight. And if you can help us get Amitav gently off stage to the book signing area, uh, that would be so much appreciated. Those of you who want your books signed, please leave through this door once Amitav has left. Those of you who want to exit the building, why would you want to do that? Is, <laughs> is, uh, please head up the stairs. So thank you again. And thank you, SFU, for supporting the team.